I'm Alex. I'm one of the co-founders of Journey. Um, and what we are working on is making blissful meditative experiences more accessible. So this whole story started for me, I guess, three or four years ago when I discovered jhana meditation, which is a type of meditation that is focused on evoking feelings of joy or love or peace and then using those emotions as the object of meditation. Um, and in contrast to many other meditative methods like following your breath or doing a body scan, this type of meditation evokes uh, really like peak states in meditation fairly deterministically. So people talk about experiences that are similar to MDMA or you know like the best day of their lives. Um, and this is a type of meditation that has been incredibly like rewarding and has led to a lot of personal growth for me. And so as a company, we're really dedicated to making this more accessible for everyone else out there in the world. So what are the jhanas? Um, there are about 5,000 meditators in the US that are practicing states known as the jhanas today. As I talked about before, these states are incredibly highly valenced. So people describe them as the best thing that's happened in my lifetime, um, possibly the most expected value thing you can do with your time. Um, and they're becoming a more active area for academic research. So there are jhana studies underway right now at Harvard and McGill. Um, and there's actually a study that's in the very early stages in Cambridge as well. One of the things that's so exciting about the jhanas is that unlike many other forms of meditation, they are very discrete in nature. So it's not a gradient from more concentrated to less concentrated. It's actually a series of very discrete states, which makes it much easier to study scientifically because you can have much better data on what is a jhana and what's not. You can do more kind of robust phenomenological interviews. So in addition to the actual qualities of the states themselves, we think they're a really promising target for academic research. And this is actually an area that's gotten more press coverage in the last six months as well. So we've seen articles in Vox, um, in Asterisk Magazine, and then in The Atlantic about the jhanas. So it's actually a really exciting time to be working on this because there's both academic interest and seemingly more interest in the public sphere as well. Before I go to this, actually, I'm gonna show a two minute video of meditators on one of the past few retreats that we ran just describing their experience. Um, I think this is actually really cool to give a sense of what these experiences are like and just make it a little bit more human. This shit is crazy. I, <laughs> <laughs> most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. I've just been like, in it basically since 5 a.m. How, how did this exist? I thought everyone was being really dramatic on Twitter talking about the jhanas, but they, they were very right. They like, were secret about the jhanas, right? Like, like they don't, I don't know why people don't talk about them. Probably like top three weeks of my life, to be honest. Just like the density of wild experiences. It was amazing. <laughs> I just couldn't feel my body. Everything felt like bliss. It was like so blissful that my hands were shaking. I tried medicine assisted psychotherapy just for like healing and treatment. And this was more intense than that by far. So I'm hoping to try to use it therapeutically. And it went from, oh, okay, I'm feeling meta to, oh my God, that's incredibly beautiful. And I started crying. So I felt a, a flood of positive emotion, love, gratitude, and happiness. And my heart space opened up. I started to tear up. It was like a tingling. I still felt the after effects for probably about an hour or so. The bigger problem now is it's so intense that I'm tapping out the meditation at about an hour. I want to go longer, but about an hour, I'm like, this is intense. I got to take a break. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. This has been like a life-changing moment for me. Just got my brain blown out <laughs> the past week. <laughs> like I've been on the craziest bender of my life. <laughs> like senior week doesn't compare from undergrad. This experience profoundly changed my life. I will be a lifelong meditator after this. Thank you guys. Yeah, and I, I share all this just to say, like this is really life-changing stuff, and I think it's a very worthy object of study, and I would love to find some way to make it accessible to everyone very easily. The big problem here, at least this, under the status quo, is that learning the jhanas is fairly difficult. Um, historically, it's taken maybe hundreds of hours of guesswork on retreat. Um, we're actually running retreats today where it probably takes something like you know, 30 or 40 hours for like a 50% outcome. Um, and the original thought behind the company was, 
can we find ways to make these states more accessible more quickly? And our initial thought on how to do that was using EEG neurofeedback as a way to teach the jhanas. So one way you can imagine doing this is having some kind of consumer EEG headset, which is um, you know, something like the Muse, for example, would be a version of this that's already on the market. And you can use that headset to gather EEG data from a bunch of expert jhana meditators and then build some kind of classifier that says, okay, this is baseline meditative data, this is jhana data, and maybe you have a couple steps in between, but you're using that data as a way to give real-time feedback on whether someone is closer, closer or further from the jhanas. Um, and as they get closer, you can imagine all kinds of different varieties of feedback. I mean, it could be a teacher looking at the data saying, hey, maybe try this instead of this. It could be music that's changing as the person is meditating. Um, but if you're getting that kind of real-time feedback, that eliminates probably the biggest problem with learning meditative techniques, which is that it's invisible and requires a lot of guesswork because nobody can see what's going on inside your head and give you really tangible feedback on it. And we were really excited about this approach because there's actually a lot of kind of novel research from the last few years that shows it's possible for novices to imitate uh, really expert meditators' brainwaves in as little as 60 minutes. So I'm gonna play another video. We're interested in improving well-being and reduced stress. And one way to do this is through meditation. So meditation has been shown to help a host of problems ranging from addictions to anxiety to even ADHD. So we wanted to know what's going on in people's brains when they're meditating. And we took experience in novice meditators and gave them a very simple task while we had them lay in our fMRI scanner. The task was to meditate, to pay attention to their physical sensation of their breath. Now this might sound simple, but it's not particularly easy. When we give experienced meditators this task, we can look at their brain activity and see that certain parts of their brains get really quiet. Now these same parts of the brain get overactivated when we're anxious, when we're craving things, basically when we're getting in our own way. And experienced meditators, as you would expect, these brain regions get really quiet. Now it gets really interesting when we look at novice meditators. We can even use new techniques called real-time neurofeedback where we can give them moment to moment to moment feedback from their brain while they're meditating. Now here's an example of a novice meditator. You can see here in the red is showing that his mind is wandering and in the blue that he's uh, trying to concentrate on meditation. And you can see in the first three runs, he's not particularly doing a great job. The third run's interesting because he said, you know, I don't even think your neurofeedback works. I was thinking about my breath, but the graph was suggesting that my mind was wandering, that I wasn't. And the very next run, his brain looked completely different. And he came out of there and said, oh, I get it, feeling the physical sensation of my breath rather than thinking about it. That neurofeedback showed him where to look and showed him that he was thinking versus feeling the physical sensation of his breath. So, so perhaps we can even start to use these types of techniques to help people train, to provide this mental mirror so they can see what their brain's doing when they're trying to learn how to do techniques like meditation, which might be simple, but not particularly easy to do. As Vince Lombardi said, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. Maybe we can use this neurofeedback as a way to help people practice perfectly. That video shows both um, EEG and fMRI as modalities for neurofeedback, um, but we were kind of primarily interested in EEG, and we talked to Judd a few times. We actually think it's a pretty tractable problem to do EEG neurofeedback for this type of meditation. Um, and over the course of probably nine to 12 months last year, we ran around and worked with all of the leading jhana teachers in North America and Europe, and we built, um, I think, what is the world's largest EEG data set for advanced meditative states. So we have data from 35 people doing the jhanas, um, about like two or three hours plus per person. Um, and using that data, we were actually able to build a classifier for jhana versus non-jhana meditative data. So what we're showing in this video is, on the right-hand side, you see somebody meditating with an EEG headset on. They're holding a game controller, which is what we use to demarcate transitions between different baselines and the jhanas, and um, you know, both cognitive baselines and muscular baselines. And then on the left-hand side, what you're seeing is the actual accuracy that's coming out of the classifier. So about halfway through the video, the participant clicks on the game controller, which indicates that they are moving into a jhana. And as they're doing that, you can see the accuracy of the classifier go up from the kind of like white section of the graph to the yellow section of the graph. So the person is meditating, 
Um, I, I actually forget if the exact frame where they hit the button is in here or not, but eventually they hit the button, the prediction accuracy is going up, um, and just continues to go up as they keep meditating. And then here are a few of the kind of descriptive stats from the analysis we ran on this data set. The way we approach this analysis is, you know, with EEG data, you essentially have a waveform for all of the electrodes on the cap. Um, and what we're doing is we're just chopping that data up into four second intervals. And then we are training a classifier for each of those kind of sections of, we're training a classifier that looks at each of those sections of data and says, you know, what are the odds that this is jhana versus non jhana? And so, um, there's still a lot of work to do to make this a really robust analysis that could be used for EEG neurofeedback. It's a bit of an open question for this type of meditation, like what is an acceptable rate of false positives? Um, you know, how robust does this classifier really have to be to add value to somebody in a meditative setting? But all this shows, I think, pretty like convincingly that it's a tractable problem. Like we're already getting better than chance classification accuracy. And I think with more work, you could probably make that accuracy a lot better. And then in terms of future work, there's a couple things we're really excited about. We feel like now there's at least a reasonable sense of what the neural correlates of the jhanas are based on this EEG data. I think there are a few more things that we're excited to explore with this data set, like um, muscle noise, for example, is a really big issue with kind of any EEG analysis, and especially for our analysis where people are experiencing really joyful states, they're, they're often smiling while they're in those states. And so making sure that you're not just building a smile detector uh, is a really important part of what we're doing. Um, we're also, uh, kind of from a broader company perspective, over the last nine months, we've had a bit of a shift in philosophy from let's just make really robust technology to teach the jhanas to let's actually run retreats and make technology at the same time. And so we're trying to come up with ways to layer tech into a retreat environment in a way that's like immediately additive and I think that's actually gonna give us a really good opportunity to just tweak the pedagogy and tweak the tech all at the same time. So that's what we're prioritizing now is, um, you know, can we find other, maybe a little bit less robust, but a little bit easier to operationalize methods of giving feedback, as opposed to EEG, where there's like a very time-consuming setup process, a uh, very time-consuming teardown process. Um, so it just takes a little bit more time. And then, kind of from like a soft science perspective too. I think there's some really interesting work to be done to do like development trajectories and like skill trees, essentially seeing if there are different types of learning traits that are correlated to learning the jhanas um, beyond just like an EEG kind of scientific approach. So if you're interested in any of the above, let me know and I would love to chat about it. Yeah, I don't think any of this should be secret knowledge. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs>